Thank you for joining this session today. So uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Wendy Chen from LVMH. I'm actually the Regional Director uh, on uh, Digital and Digital uh, for Asia. So I'm currently based in Shanghai, so it's good to be back in Singapore. I used to live there. So uh, today is a very interesting topic uh, that is actually very related to us as well, because uh, I'm currently in Shanghai. So. Uh, we look into the China consumers uh, very often. So this session is about luxury market and consumers in China and Hong Kong. And I'm also from Hong Kong as well, so I'm actually pretty looking forward to hear the whole sessions. So um, that's uh, without deal. Uh, let me introduce the first uh, speaker today. And uh, it's actually Jeff Wang. Uh, he's the professor of marketing of City University of Hong Kong. And he's going to share with us uh, the topic of uh, one country, two system, consumer acculturation uh, of locals. So I'll leave the floor. Thank you very much, Wendy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being at this session. Uh, my name is Jeff Han from City University of Hong Kong. Uh, it's great to be here at this conference, my very first time. Uh, even more delighted to be with my co-authors uh, today, uh, Russ from uh, York University in Canada and uh, Jamie from uh, University of British Columbia at Copenhagen. Uh, wonderful co-authors, so I'm really pleased to present this work uh, here. Uh, title of our research, uh, by the way, this research is actually being reviewed at a, a, a academic journal, so uh, any comments will be appreciated. Um, to further improve this paper. One country, two systems. You know what we're talking about? You know which country are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, one country, two systems. And, and consumer acculturation of locals. So we're actually studying uh, some interesting phenomena that are related to uh, luxury retail. So the, the, the focal context that we're studying is the luxury retail uh, that happens in Hong Kong. Um, who are we studying? We're actually studying two groups of consumers. The, the main group of consumers we study are the Hong Kong locals. Um, we study how they acculturate when they see so many mainland tourists come to Hong Kong and buy luxury goods. But at the same time, we also collect a lot of data from the mainland Chinese tourists who buy luxury in Hong Kong. Uh, so what are we going to study? Uh, we study, you can say, two phenomena, but they're really interconnected. On one hand, is mainland Chinese tourists, they're buying luxury in Hong Kong. On the other hand, when the Hong Kong consumers, the Hong Kong locals, they have to you know, share the shopping space with the, the Chinese tourists, what do they do? How do they respond? How do they adapt? So that's the main um, phenomenon that we study. So a couple of pictures that probably are not so surprising. You see a, a large number of wealthy, mainland tourists, they come to Hong Kong and they buy luxury uh, goods. Obviously, those luxury stores are also used by the Hong Kong locals. So what we are really interested in is, okay, what do Hong Kong consumers think about this? Treat this mainland consumers. By the way, I use mainland because mainland versus Hong Kong, right? So we have this mainland Chinese and Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, they're, they're, they're all Chinese, but you know, just to differentiate them, we use the word mainland. Um, so what we're interested in is when these Chinese consumers or mainland consumers become to Hong Kong, how do Hong Kong consumers respond and, uh, and adapt? A little bit background of this research. So the handover of Hong Kong back to mainland China happened 20 well, 20, 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, in 1999. And at that time, there were only about 2.3 million mainlanders visit Hong Kong. Look at the number again. In 2014, it reached a peak. 47.2 million mainlanders did visit Hong Kong that year. Okay, what did they do in Hong Kong? Shop, shop, and shop, right? So spending reached uh, US dollars 30 billion US dollars in 2014. And overwhelming for the locals, obviously, Hong Kong has a pretty big population, right? Seven million. But if you see that seven million locals versus 47 million visitors, that's really overwhelming for them, right? And uh, because of this uh, mainland tourists come to Hong Kong, it gives a lot of incentive for the retail and property to develop their business. So that's a little bit background of this research. 
Our research purpose, to put it in one sentence, is to examine Hong Kong locals' acculturation process as they observe, encounter, and shop for luxury goods with an influx of outsiders from mainland China. So I hope you understand the, the focal phenomenon that we are studying in this research. Okay, as an academic research, we have to put out the theoretical contributions, right? So the, the, the literature that we draw from is from the consumer acculturation literature. So basically, this stream of research, they study how usually newcomers, when they arrive at a new place, usually immigrants, how they adapt to this new uh, buying environment, how they, how they adapt to this new culture, and so forth. But our research actually study, you could say, the other side of the coin. So we're saying that, okay, even the Hong Kong locals, they don't move, but because of this influx of mainland tourists coming to their own city, they have to adapt. They have to change in a certain way. So that's what we're studying in this research. And the second, uh, we want to study um, this acculturation process as embedded in institutional dynamics. So later I'm going to talk a little bit about the institutional theory as the overarching uh, uh, umbrella that you know basically influence uh, the micro level shopping behavior. And thirdly, we want to study emotions. Right. So previous literature and acculturation they studied consumers' behavior, which is very interesting and very important. But also we are saying that okay, as consumers they adapt, they they get. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they face this changing environment. They also show particular emotions uh, in this process. So these are the main three main contributions in this research. Uh, method. Uh, this is a qualitative research. So we actually use a, a mix of qualitative methods in this study. Uh, our focus is luxury brands of clothing and accessories. Uh, we study both Hong Kongers and, and mainland Chinese who buy luxury goods mostly in Hong Kong, although when we uh, interview those uh, you know, consumers, they may buy luxury goods in different parts of the world. Uh, we use long and short interviews, participant observation, and also net neurography. Especially toward the end of this the data collection, we collect a lot of data from the internet because we want to see the, the, the exchanges between the mainlanders and Hong Kongers and also among themselves about this phenomenon what they say and you know, the emotions that they express. That's the method. Um, this is, uh, probably cannot see it very clearly, this is a so-called theoretical framework of this, of this research. I'm going to talk about this more in detail in the, in the following slides. But the, the main idea of this, of this framework is that we first want to understand what are the institutional environments, both in mainland China and in Hong Kong, and how these different institutional environments affect people's buying behavior. So that's the first thing we want to look at, understand the big picture. And then the, the box uh, at the bottom uh, is, is really our focus of this study. We want to understand the Hong Kong locals' acculturation process. And there are three aspects that we, want, uh, that we investigate. One is their behavioral adaptation, one is their emotional response, and one is their identity negotiation. Those are the three aspects in their acculturation process. Okay, so now let's look at uh, some of the findings. Uh, first, I want to show you, okay, you may have this question already in your mind. Why do mainland Chinese go to Hong Kong to buy luxury goods? Price. <coughs> price, price, right? Put it simply, price. Price is at the micro level. So how come the price is cheaper? or maybe the quality is, is better, or the service is better. Why? So we want to understand that by looking at the institutional perspective, the more specific, the regulative perspective in China and in Hong Kong. Right? So there's a few reasons. No import duty in Hong Kong, whereas there's high import tax in mainland. Right? That explains the price factor. RMB, that's the Chinese, uh, China's currency, quickly appreciated since 2005, right? And uh, whereas Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the U.S. dollar, so the you know the the currency value doesn't change over the years. So basically, it means that if you have RMB in your pocket, you can buy more. Assurance of uh, product authenticity and quality. 
thanks to Hong Kong's stringent regulatory environment. So if you buy a luxury goods, you are sure that this is an authentic one. You are not going to get a fake one. And last but not least, this is very uh, special in, in China. It's called Individual Visit Scheme. Individual Visit Scheme, IBS. So basically that started um, about 15 years ago after SARS. I'm not sure how, uh, Singapore was hit by that. So about 2004, and, and mainland China, the Chinese government, in order to help Hong Kong's economy, they opened this new scheme, basically allowing more mainland, mainlanders to visit Hong Kong without being in a group, right? So they basically, um, they can go to uh, Hong Kong freely with that IBS. So right now there are 49 mainland cities. So citizens in those 49 cities, they can go to Hong Kong freely with that, uh, with that kind of visa. So those are the reasons that push mainlanders to buy luxury in Hong Kong. However, the regulatory change can also turn the tide what does that mean? Okay, a few things in the last few years. There's a ban, this is in mainland China, there's a ban on public advertising that features words like high class and luxury. There's a, there has been, since 2013, the new president of, of PRC, uh, he started this anti-corruption campaign and that has really uh, driven down luxury consumption not only in Hong Kong, but you know, everywhere in China. Uh, and in recent years, they have stopped opening new cities for IBS. So right now, this, the number stays at 49. No more cities that can have the IBS uh, scheme. So basically stop more Chinese consumers to visit Hong Kong. And agreement between China and Western countries to ease mainlanders overseas travel. Meaning what? Meaning that mainlanders, they don't have to go to Hong Kong to buy luxury. They can go to Europe, they can go to the US and other countries to buy luxury. So there's not so much incentive for mainlanders to go to Hong Kong to buy. Plus, free duty free, uh, free uh, first duty free stores in Hainan. So this is more like an experiment that Chinese government is trying to, to use Hainan as an island, also a, a province that uh, have these duty-free shops. So people, Chinese people, mainlanders, they can go to Hainan and buy a lot of things without duty. Okay, so this is a new experiment and see how, how we're gonna see how it's gonna unfold in the future. But those are some of the regulatory uh, factors that both push and push a mainland Chinese to buy luxury in Hong Kong. So now we're gonna look at more micro, right? So more micro aspects and we look at the Cultivation process of the Hong Kong locals. We have, as you may remember, in that figure, we have three main aspects in Hong Kong locals' acculturation process behavioral adaptation, emotional response, and also identity negotiation. So I'm going to uh, elaborate on each of them one by one. First is Hong Kong locals' behavioral adaptation. So this is more, it's the most obvious one. Uh, as we find in our research. So basically, Hong Kong locals, in a way, change their shopping behavior as they, as they see more and more mainland tourists come to Hong Kong and, and, and buy luxury, right? So this slide, basically, I'm going to probably read a couple of them. Uh, in terms of Hong Kong locals' response when choosing the brand and also the luxury retail store, uh, the first one is that originally LV, I'm sorry, this is sponsored by LV <laughs> uh, Originally LV was fine for me, but I will not buy the bread again. All fat mainland housewives and bareheaded middle-aged men carry LV. Right? So, so I guess it's not surprising that uh, you know the, the, the genuine value of luxury is not only the object itself, but also the persons who carry the objects, right? So when the Hong Kong locals, they see, oh, those people, they also buy this brand, right? They become less willing to buy the same, uh, same brand. And also in Hong Kong, very interesting is to avoid particular retail locations. And in, in Hong Kong, there's a place called Qin Sa Zui, TST, which is at the tip of the peninsula. It's where the mainland Chinese love to go because it's a convenient uh, transportation. And a lot of retail stores, they cater to the mainland Chinese, right? So 
this informant says that many of us do not go to TSB anymore. It's crowded because of PRC tours. The stores cater to them. They have taken over these spaces. This is what we call being occupied. Right? So you see, they avoid certain brands. They avoid certain, uh, certain shops uh, because they are uh, being used by the mainland tourists. Here are some pictures. You see the obviously there are the, the, the picture on the right. They're all mainlanders, right? So after they buy some luxury shops, as a group, right? As a group, they kind of show it off. And you see a lot of people waiting outside the retail uh, luxury retail stores. Um, but avoidance is not the only behavior that is taken by locals. Right? We also see protest, even confrontation by Hong Kong locals. So this is one uh, <coughs> says that mainlanders stand, stand in line, as the picture just showed, for hours outside luxury brand stores. They take over the shopping. Hong Kong people avoid these shopping districts because they feel they are being shut out of these places. Remember, they are the locals. They feel that they are entitled to this retail space, but now they are being shut out. Uh, from these places. Uh, so this is not the city we knew and loved. It is changing, and we want our city back. Right? So we see that um, uh, frequently from our informants, from our Hong Kong informants. In 2012, there's a couple of very interesting movements uh, happening in Hong Kong. It's a few years back. In 2012, there's uh, over 1,000 people with more than 22,000 supporters on Facebook stages a, a mass protest in front of DNG in TSP. Because PRC visitors, this is true, uh, a lot of reports about this, PRC, the mainland visitors, they were allowed to take photos, but not locals. The locals got really angry and upset. So they don't want to show you a picture of them. So they went to the street, you know, outside DNG shop and, and this big protest. Another movement is called the Light Movement. Uh, was to reclaim shopping places heavily patronized by mainland tourists. On Facebook, they stated that tenants had been making way for big retailers and quickly received 3,000 likes. This is another movement called the Light Movement in Hong Kong. And uh, there's some Hong Kong locals who got really angry. They got really angry and they, they, you know, on the internet and even they go to the shopping malls, they go back to China, you Chinese buy Chinese products. So you can see this confrontation, some are even the physical confrontation uh, by the Hong Kong locals. Uh, some car carried banners saying that get rid of the barbarians, you know what the, who are the barbarians refer to, cancel multiple entry permits. Uh, they even waved the flag used in the colonial period and police resorted to arrest to stop them. So here are some of the uh, pictures that show what happened. The, the picture on the right is what happened outside Dongji Cabana. You have hundreds of people protest, uh, protest outside it. And also the, the picture on the left, this is really happened, right? They, some especially young people, they identify the mainland tourists in the shopping mall, carrying luxury bags and so forth. They go harass them, right? And shouting uh, some bad words uh, toward them. The second thing that we find in this, the Hong Kong locals acculturation process is their emotion. And we find uh, three main emotions that appeared uh, you know, for, for us Hong Kong uh, locals. One is envy, which is understandable because the Hong Kong people, they realize that the mainlanders are getting wealthy, getting richer. Right now, they have the money. Right? So the Hong Kong locals, they, they, they actually they acknowledge that we can no longer compare the mainland in wealth. So there must be envy. Right, so that's one uh, emotion by the Hong Kong locals. There's also resentment. Resentment is the Hong Kong is when the Hong Kong locals they realize that their own shopping space is being occupied and being uh, prepared for the for the for the tourists, right? Not for their own needs. So there's resentment. But the, the, probably the most interesting one is anger. So we see a lot of people. Uh, go to the extreme. The, the confrontation I showed you just now is, is one example, and there are a lot of, a lot of shouting and, and, and on the internet, social media, we find a lot of data on that. Um, you know, just back this 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 one is a, a quote from the internet. Just back from the Newtown Plaza, I'm very mad. I get mad when I see those locusts. Chinese tourists carry so many suitcases to shop. And by the way, this term locust was carefully selected by the Hong Kong locals. Because as you can imagine, when the locals come, 
and one that leave, nothing, nothing left, right? So this term actually, you know, uh, stimulated a lot of anger among <coughs> Hong Kong people, uh, and the people actually arguing that you know there has to be some changes by the Hong Kong government and also the Chinese government. Uh, so these are a couple of pictures. So this is a guy, you know, waving the, uh, the the Hong Kong flag that was used during the colonial period. And uh, the picture on the left, written in Chinese, but uh, basically, uh, but you can see the locust, right? So they're basically no more locust. Get rid of my place. Um, so we can we will find strong emotions from the Hong Kong locals. And last but not least is the identity negotiation, and this is probably. Uh, at a deeper level, right? Because of Hong Kong's history, Hong Kong's culture, it was the Britain's uh, uh, colony for more than 100 years, but now it is part of PRC. So the identity has been a very interesting issue for for all Hong Kong people. And um, and in this research, we find that because of this conflict in, in consumption in retail, uh, we we see this identity has been even um, getting even stronger. Um, so, because of time limit, I'm just going to quickly um, go through this. In, in their experience with the uh, with luxury goods, the Hong Kong locals emphasize authenticity, exclusivity, quality, and respectful service, which allow them to divide themselves versus others. Right. So it has to be a it has to draw a line between us as a local and the outsiders being the mainlanders, right? So there are certain factors that they can use in, in, in luxury consumption, in luxury brands to differentiate themselves from the mainlanders. Uh, there's very unique identity as one person says that I'm not from the mainland, I'm from Hong Kong. Hong Kong had ties to Britain and now unfortunately to China. And we heard that a lot from the from the local <laughs> Hong Kong groups. Um, so this Hong Kong identity is a Chinese plus Westernness. Uh, so some scholars have been studying that uh, in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. But if you look at some statistics, it's very interesting. Uh, if you look at, this is about 9% identify themselves as Chinese in 2014, much higher at the time of handover. Right? It was about 32%. And then it decreased to only 9% in 2014. About 27 identi 27 percent identify themselves as Hong Kong girls in 2014, the highest since 1997. So we are arguing that because of this, the influx of mainland tourists, there are, there is also the drive these Hong Kong locals to to negotiate their their own identities, which is uh, obviously further away from being Chinese. Uh, the Chinese government highlights that one country sees two systems. From our interviews, most of our informants said the two systems approach is what they truly want. Okay, given the time allowed, I'm going to skip the discussion um, for the end. I think my time is up, right? So it's open up for questions. I'm glad that I have my two wonderful co-authors to answer all your tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> because of foreign investment, it's mostly Chinese. Chinese. And this is what happened to Hong Kong as well. Uh, I guess uh, the, the difference is that unlike other countries who have been able to protect themselves, in the West, in their poor setting of certain uh, regulations preventing uh, foreign investment or raising special taxes or special levy, Hong Kong is integrated in China and doesn't have that uh, so that's the institutional factor that we discussed, right? Because of the, <coughs> the, the policies, the laws, or certain constraints that Hong Kong can do and cannot do yeah. because it's not part of China. Right? But I think your, your question is right. It's not just about Hong Kong. I, 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 I am even suspicious that Singapore has a certain level of problem of, of, of Chinese coming into the city and buying stuff and joining up with property provides and so forth. Um, and because China is such a big population, and so it, and it's getting the people getting wealthy, so one day go to 
different parts of the world, I think they may have a big impact. Yeah, I, I, I agree with them. I, I'm just, uh, the statistics the last time I, I heard from China is they might have only about 100 or 200 million passports. And, and, and I think when it gets to 500 or 600 million passports, then you'll see an invasion, literally, right, right on, of people yeah. uh, visiting of different parts of the parts of the country. Yeah, invasion, invasion that's, a, that's the term that we often heard yeah. from, our, from our interviews. So invasion. that's why I'm, I'm just looking, I mean, Hong Kong has a very special problem because of the proximity and the easy entry and so on. But once the passports sort of uh, come to be, then I've been in, in a remote part of uh, uh, Turkey about two years ago, and the entire hotel was occupied by Chinese. And even the menu yeah. for breakfast was essentially key. That was a few years ago. So suddenly you look at it in terms of the tourism, suddenly as it catches on, and then effectively the resentment would be if you go to the airports like in Paris, on your return, entire lines essentially claiming credit for right. customs, essentially is, is hundreds of people long. Right? Yeah. I think and you're saying two things. One is that more Chinese are going overseas, and yeah. that we have seen that in our research. Mm -hmm. Actually, less people coming to Hong Kong to buy luxury. Mm -hmm. uh, and second is that uh, they're saying that only people from the third tier cities come to Hong Kong now. Yeah. But really wealthy people, they, they go to Europe yes. or overseas to buy luxury. The yeah. last point I'm, I'm, I'm making is I think when such a large numbers of one ethnic group essentially visits a city or town, uh, then there's a racism, racist element that actually gets attached. That's right. right? In fact, you suddenly you say, hey, I see a thousand Chinese in Berlin, and people are labeled in terms of why they're here. Yeah. Right? So there's a racism element that is there. I mean, implicitly, that's what you're seeing here as well. Right. We are Hong Kong, whereas these guys are mainland Chinese, though I think from outside, it looks like you're all Chinese. Uh, right. in terms of origin, right. but they feel that there's, there's a racism, racist element that's actually creeping up. So, again, I was hoping that you would have a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Somebody has to pay us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have one, one more question, okay. and then so we can have all the questions at the end okay. because of the timing. So maybe maybe one from the middle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, really, I really like this project. Uh, because it speaks to, I think, an issue as you know, the comments highlight that is going to become more and more prevalent, which is like the heterogeneity of you know customer segments coming together yes. like in, in the marketplace, right? So I think that the broader issue. I'm going to make a more academic kind of comment rather than managerial kind of comment. Um, you know, I think that your data is so rich that I think that trying to squeeze it into one paper is going to be, um, you know, and probably has been a struggle. Uh, I think this is the kind of project that would be great, actually, as, as a book, you know, from my perspective, <laughs> rather, rather than, a, rather than a, an article. Because I feel like you've mentioned a lot of the different theoretical frames. It feels like this is a kind of project where you've been kind of like, you know, juggling with different theoretical frames, and, and some are still there, you know, they are a little bit like the locusts of your, of your own paper, right? <laughs> you've, you've talked about like identity, acculturation, institutional theory, so I think that, like for example, if I was to look at your data, there's a lot of stuff about affect. You know, that's another angle, and and I think like affect as it is produced by customer heterogeneity and customer you know segments together, like would be another very interesting like angle for your paper. So it seems to me like just from an academic perspective, it seems to me that you have, you know, you have to slice it because it's just it's too too rich and too complex at this stage. That's my take on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. I do actually have a, I do actually have a comment, but it's very different from the country. I think my uh, my concern is more about business because it's for us it's also a dynamic. Because uh, you got Chinese tourists, they spend a lot of money. They are key customers. At the same time, how we can actually remain the consumer experience in the store, I think it's the most important thing. So I think for us it's more about the business dynamic. How we actually can can serve both Chinese customers while also maintain that consumer experience with the Hong Kong people. So I think those are the major ones. But this is uh, this is for global, you know. Uh, yes, exactly. In any city where you are, I was discussing with Mr. Arthur, you know, uh, that uh, can you actually serve everybody in one store? Ultimately, the generations, <laughs> the different geographic, the traditional buyer of luxury, the new buyer of luxury. We all want different things. Yes, and uh, I think we can continue that discussion, and I think it's a very interesting topic for the first topic.